everyone. It's Naomi Wolf of Daily Clout, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have State Representative Peter Durant with us today. Welcome, State Representative Durant. Thank you for having me. Um, we're delighted and we're grateful to you for waking up early on the uh, on the West Coast to join us. Um, and it's so important what you're doing. Uh, I found out about you because of news reports about a bill you've introduced, HD 4416. But before we get into that, I just want to tell people um, that uh, State Representative Durant is a representative for the 6th Worcester District of Massachusetts. He's been a state representative in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts since May of 2011, so longstanding uh, public servant. Before that, he was in the tech sector, a uh, service manager with Yankee Technology, and he has a Bachelor of Science in Political Science from Northeastern University. So thank you for your service to the state of Massachusetts for all these years and to your constituents. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and just quickly read the text of your bill. Um, sure. Because, you know, we've seen a daily cloud, a number of different bills, we've drafted some to ban vaccine passports. And I'd have to say this is a really beautifully written, clear, oh. concise um, uh, bill. You could even call it an addendum because it's an amendment of the general laws of Massachusetts, a proposed amendment. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and that's typically the way we, uh, we put forward our bills is to amend those laws that, uh, that currently exist. Oh, I understand. And is that a different process in Massachusetts than in other states? You know, it is. It, it's. Um, I'm, I can't say that I'm familiar with all the other states or or how they work. But when we are doing research, or when I'm doing research on a bill, uh, I typically go and look and see what other states are doing and how they rate them. So I can't tell you that we seem to have quite a different process than many other states. So, but it's the one I'm used to. So I understand. And does it take a majority then in the state? legislature in Massachusetts to uh, pass an amendment to the general laws like this one? Yes. Yep. It's a it's simple majority in the House and Senate uh, and then hopefully signed by the governor. OK, awesome. So um, this is Section 1, Chapter 111 of the general laws, and you propose that it's hereby amended by adding the following section. And everyone bear with me. It's super short. Section 243 notwithstanding any general or special law to the contrary, the Commonwealth shall not require proof of vaccination against COVID-19 as a condition of entry to the Commonwealth. Notwithstanding any general or special law to the contrary, the Commonwealth and all of its agencies, authorities, and political subdivisions shall not require proof of vaccination against COVID-19 as a condition of entry to a public building. Notwithstanding any general or special law to the contrary, no public or private elementary school, secondary school, high school, charter school, college, university, or other post-secondary institution of higher education shall require proof of vaccination against COVID-19 as a condition of enrollment, access to campus, or attendance in in-person classes. Notwithstanding any general or special law to the contrary, no business shall require proof of vaccination against COVID-19 as a condition of entry to the business. Section two, first paragraph of section 92A of chapter 272 of the general laws as appearing in the 2018 official edition is hereby amended by adding the following sentence. No owner, lessee, proprietor, manager, superintendent, agent or employee of any place of public accommodation, resort or amusement shall directly or indirectly by themselves or another require <clears throat> proof of vaccination against COVID-19 as a condition of entry to a place of a public accommodation, resort or amusement. And that is it. That is your bill HD 4416. Um, so thank you. So let before we go into the details of this, again, incredibly well written comprehensive bill, and I can talk about why I think it's so great in a minute. What led you to feel that this was something you needed to address as a legislator? Sure. Yeah. It, well, it's interesting as you read it, you actually it, when you kind of hear the backstory, you understand why it's written in the way it was. Originally, the bill was I, I started the bill. Uh, it came about from constituents contacting me. Their children were having some difficulties going to university right. um, and the universities were requiring them to get vaccinated. So they said, can you do something about this? Uh, we decided to write a bill to to take care of that. 
and then it kind of morphed into that. We needed to start including more things. We not, uh, needed to start including private businesses. We started hearing from employees who said, gee, my, my company is now forcing me to. They're making me wear a special name tag that says I'm not, um, I'm not vaccinated. Oh things gosh. like that. Yeah, so, so that's how the bill started adding on those sections. And then as, as I'm sure you know, Naomi, when you, as you're writing these things, you're trying to think through um, all of the unintended consequences. What did you miss? What do you, so you, you find yourself trying to expand it more and more to make sure that you're covering all your bases. And, and that's where it came about. Wow. And so is there anything that the constituents who are reaching out to you have in common? I mean, is this a partisan thing for them or is it really just like, this is my life and my kid can't go back to school or I, you know, I, I don't want to be forced to take a treatment that you know, I'm not sure about what, what is the say more about the people who are reaching out to you. The reason I ask is that in the media, critics of these mandates are being cast as partisan. It's party exactly. politics. So tell me more about, you know, what kind of range of people, obviously without naming names. Of course. Uh, you know, what I saw were constituents who were genuinely afraid of what was taking place, right? So they were worried that, first of all, their, their children in the very early stages, they were worried that their children couldn't go to school. Um, they wanted their children to attend in-person classes. They wanted them to be able to have that, that college experience like all kids get to have. Uh, and then when it expanded out to include employees, again, they were concerned about being able to go to work. And, and it really struck me when they, when I, I got calls from a specific employer within my district, um, that was saying they had to, they they now were required to wear certain colored um, name tags now to identify them, and, and so so they were genuinely worried about where this was going and what was happening to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think in in Massachusetts, obviously we're a, a pretty left leaning state. Um, as a Republican, Massachusetts, I'm 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 one of few, so I. I think you see, or at least it's believed that it's a very partisan issue. Um, although this is a bipartisan bill, we have both Republicans and Democrats who have signed on. Wow. Uh, you know, I think it's perceived that, yes, it's, it's the right wing that's, that's, that's pushing this kind of agenda. Um, but so, in your experience, that's not the case. It's, uh, it's a bipartisan bill. As you said, you've got bipartisan yeah. support. Is that right? Yeah, we, we've got some bipartisan support. Um, and again, I think it's, when you start to think through these issues, you realize that there are legitimate issues to, um, you know, to not having these kind of passports, to not forcing you to have a vaccine, and it and it becomes nonpartisan. Right. Um, I I really love the simplicity of the language, as I mentioned. Um, I I love it when. <laughs> legislators write bills that everyone can understand. But I also really like how you comprehensively addressed um, so many of the areas that we're hearing people being upset about, schooling, businesses. I yeah. like how you basically said, you know, you can't require this to access a public building. And you you even, and I think this is beautiful, and you know, we're nonpartisan, but I think I'm allowed to say when, when sure. you know, a bill is beautifully written, the final kind of coda really does say Massachusetts won't discriminate against mm -hmm. people. It, it seems to me like very anti-discrimination language that's comprehensive and very much echoing other important anti-discrimination legislation, like you can't keep people out on the basis of their disability or on the basis of their race or you know, sexual orientation or other forms of discrimination. Was that in your mind at all with that last uh, section? A absolutely. Uh, as I say, we, we, as I was, drafting this bill, you had to kind of think about what uh, you were trying to accomplish and what words would encompass that, um, which is why we put in there public accommodations, right? Mm -hmm. Public accommodations, at least in Massachusetts law, uh, is very, very broad. You would think if you hear the term public accommodations, you think hotels and motels, right. but it's basically any place where um, a, a person of the, in the public can go to. Right. And wow. so it's very specific and you have to make sure you encompass all of these definitions within there. So we thought about that. Right. And 
we thought about the discrimination factor of this. And, and actually that became a very important part of this because you know there were a lot of people arguing against my bill. There's a lot of people arguing for these passports um, and mandates. And one of the things that we've, we were, I've tried to touch upon is the fact that I certainly believe that it, it uh, violates the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. What and is I think the Commerce it's, Clause of the Constitution, for those who don't know? What is so, it? so the Commerce Clause uh, uh, says that it is up to the federal government um, through legislative process to regulate the trade by and between the states. Hmm. And a lot of people think, well, what's that matter? It doesn't matter if, um, if your local restaurant requires a vaccine mandate, they're not participating in interstate commerce. Right. Um, but as the Supreme Court, as you know, Naomi, the Supreme Court has ruled on numerous occasions that uh, the Commerce Clause has broad implications. And so even if, if you have a place of public accommodations, we get back to that word, then it's possible I live in southern. Uh, I, I live in central Massachusetts, but on the southern border with Connecticut. Mm -hmm. If a restaurant in my district, if somebody comes from Connecticut to go to that restaurant, you all of a sudden have uh, uh, have participated in interstate commerce and that's therefore right. fall into that clause. Right. So I think that's a really important aspect to this, um, and it, it goes to that that discrimination factor. Right. Uh, it, and so it's 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 really an interesting topic. Absolutely. Um, so public accommodations in the state of Massachusetts, I've been really struck at the um, really dissolving of community bonds um, that are happening as a result of churches and synagogues and mosques and places of worship being restricted in operating. Right. I don't know the status in Massachusetts, but would places of worship be included um, as being allowed to open up without asking people their vaccination status? Yes, they would. Um, and, and again, it, it gets to that essentially public accommodations mean anywhere that you would accommodate the public, any place that the public can come into. Right. So um, theaters, symphony halls. Exactly. In other words, this, I, I love this, this bill or this amendment because it, it really makes it impossible. Like even if manufacturers roll out vaccine passports as they have IBM has in New York State where I'm interviewing you from they can't use them <laughs> if, right. if a, a law like this is in place uh, people will be able to walk into public buildings without having to show their vaccine passport and and in fact it seems like um, business owners and universities and all of these leaders of these entities covered by your amendment would be breaking the law by demanding that people show their papers. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. But, you know, one of the things, I guess one of the downsides of this is, is everything's moving very fast, right? Uh, you're seeing a lot of new issues come up um, and people are trying to find a way around them. And so since filing this bill, you know, you try to think of everything that that you can think of. You try to close those loopholes, but we realize that there are still loopholes in this bill. So, so a company could not require you to prove that you've been vaccinated, but technically they could still give you a different colored tag to, to let everybody else know you're not vaccinated. So there's actually, you end up with loopholes that you think, you know, how did we, you know, how do you, how do you now amend your amendment to right, get- Right, I understand. But, you know, as, as someone with a, disability that isn't visible. I've often wondered how the Americans with Disabilities Act doesn't already cover people from being right. singled out for discrimination against their them on the basis of their physical status. Isn't that illegal already under the ADA in Massachusetts? Yeah, absolutely. And um, in, in Massachusetts has actually broadened out um, a number of their protected classes, um, of course, on disabilities, on color, on, uh, on gender, on gender identity, all, all kinds of things. We, we make sure that we can't discriminate against any class of people. So uh, yeah, this is just another class of that discrimination that you're going to, going to see. But can't, I, I'm sorry to press That's, on this, but I'm getting so many emails from people with disabilities asking me about this. And a lot of them live in Massachusetts. Isn't it already in violation of the ADA for this hypothetical employer in Massachusetts to single people out to wear a different colored tag based on their med medical status or anything biological about them, right? Isn't that well, covered? 
by the ADA. You know, you would think that it falls in part under under the various HIPAA laws that we have right. um, to medical privacy. Um, but I think there have been rulings that that asking somebody for their vaccination status is not a violation of HIPAA. And, and I think you also run into the situation where, um, you know, it, it kind of like President Biden said at one point where he, he uh, implemented an eviction moratorium. He said, well, I know it's not going to pass constitutional muster, but we're going to do it anyway Unbelievable. Uh, and let the courts deal with it. So I think you I think in a, in a lot of these instances, you end up saying, hey, wait a minute, this isn't constitutional. But until somebody actually brings it forward to a court. We'll just let it keep going and see what happens. Oh my gosh, that's, I mean, that's so well put. I, I really believe that's what's happening now. It's almost like mm. experimenting with the, the limits or boundaries of the constitution. Exactly. Um, in, in a very unethical way, I would say. But um, have there been uh, rulings at the state level in Massachusetts around these issues yet? Is there any, or is, has anyone brought an appeal or brought an action? I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure if my wording is correct. No, uh, sure. So we've seen some uh, cases surrounding the religious exemption. Okay. And so the religious exemption exists. Um, but, but again, as pushback to that, they try to make it more and more onerous to prove your religious exemption. Oh, wow. And, and so they, they, they keep fighting back on these things. And I'm I think sorry, in Massachusetts... Sorry, sorry, sorry to follow that's okay. up. When you say they, is it... The Democrats, I mean, I'm hearing this in state after state, I'm a Democrat, but I'm pretty upset that the Democrats <laughs> seem to be the ones pushing back. Is it the health department who's who has the power to say, we're gonna make it harder for you to prove you have a religious objection? And by the way, I'm not Catholic, I'm Jewish, but these these mRNA vaccines are based on fetal cell, cell lines. And mm -hmm. you know, I think it's pretty easy to make the case from a religious basis that you don't wanna be involved in that. Oh, sure. Um, it, it, so from, from our standpoint here in Massachusetts, it comes from the executive branch. All, I see. all taking place uh, under the executive branch's order uh, of an emergency. Is that still in in Massachusetts? We're still yes. under emergency law in Massachusetts? Yes, at this, okay. at this point we still are. Is um, the state house open in Massachusetts, Representative Durant? Well, funny that you say that because no, the state house is currently not open. Um, we in Massachusetts uh, are full-time legislators, so a lot of a lot of uh, states are not, but we're full-time legislators. We have the month of August as our recess month. So here we are, mid-September. The state house is still not open, and the reason it's not open, um, the Speaker of the House has said that the reason it's not open is because of my bill. What? Yeah. So, so he claims that my bill, he doesn't know, he wants to implement the, the vaccine mandate to come into the state house uh, and to come into session. And in Massachusetts, our constitution is written much like it's the model for the, for the federal constitution, of course. Uh, but article 10 of our Massachusetts constitution says that you cannot prevent a legislator from attending session. Right. It's able to, to prevent you from attending a session. Right. And, so as much as the speaker would like to implement a vaccine mandate and bar us from coming in, he cannot. Good. And therefore he has chosen um, based on the bill that I have, which is completely ridiculous that he would do this, but uh, he's chosen to say, well, then we can't open the state house until we figure out how to deal with this. I don't understand. Isn't it up to the legislature to either pass or not pass your bill? It hasn't passed yet, right? It, it hasn't passed yet. Uh, we haven't even got a committee hearing for it yet. This is a chicken and egg ridiculous it, situation. It, How can it, you it, legislate in person on your bill if you can't convene allegedly yeah. because of the bill? I don't understand. Well, well we've been doing our we've been doing our sessions uh, via Zoom um, in, in conference calls for the past year now. And, it, and it's my my personal belief that the speaker prefers to do it this way because it's so much easier to control a, a membership when you you'd have to do it by conference call. And I know we're getting off into the weeds, but just as it's an example. It's not in the weeds at all, actually. I This is a huge issue. And I'm hearing this in state after state after state. The state houses are closed. People are under emergency law. People are having to legislate via Zoom and huge chunks of democratic access and empowerment are being lost as a result. It's very central. Please go on. So just as, uh, as an example, if we, so we have a session, if we have a session, we all get on the, the, uh, the conference call and, and we have our session. Um, you're not allowed to speak 
on or against a bill or on against an amendment or finally on or against you cannot rebut something somebody says unless you register in advance two days in advance and state your intention of what you're going to say. So you get up on the floor or, or of course, this is by a phone call and you happen to say, I, I am against this bill because of A, B, C and D. Unless I've registered, I cannot rebut your statements. Okay. Who's, whose rules are these? This changes the very nature of legis legislating in Massachusetts. Absolutely. A absolutely. These are the rules. These are, of course, the emergency rules that are implemented at the beginning of the session. Um, and unfortunately, in Massachusetts, we have a, 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 a super majority of Democrats. And so they, they pass the, the rules they want. Unbelievable. So is there a movement to end emergency law in Massachusetts? I mean, surely the emergency is over. I know the data in Massachusetts, uh, you know, we still have COVID infections, but they're like 11th or 12th on the causes of death. Yeah. The average age of death is, is 82. I looked at those tables. Okay. So, you know, when do we get the legislature back in person legislating and the end of emergency law? I'd be lying to you if I said that um, that we were actively debating that. We're we're not. We haven't seen any real move to that uh, at this time. So, if we're under emergency law, does the legislature even have powers? Yes. Yeah. We absolutely do. Um, the emergency law uh, just allows, of course, the governor to uh, implement things that uh, that he he deems um, necessary to to public safety and public health. But they're pretty sweeping. I'm, I have a 10 year old stepson in school in Massachusetts, and those little kids are being forced to wear masks all day long without yeah. any data provided to us as parents, as step parents, that this is actually good for them. And a lot of data is mounting up that it's quite harmful educationally, language acquisition, you know, emotional expression. So those are the kinds of things that Governor Baker is is mandating or that the the uh, health departments are mandating um, and that are affecting daily life in Massachusetts. Yeah, health department and um, uh, Department of Education have, uh, as you as you just mentioned, uh, implemented a mask mandate for every school. And, uh, and, and you know, we are, we're seeing parents fighting back, but school committees are reluctant to go against the Department of Education. Um, and, and parents are fighting and arguing, but they're really not getting uh, very far. Oh my goodness. Could there be a bill that could pass to ban that kind of imposition of, uh, I think, an abusive condition on our kids? Yeah, we're seeing some bills filed as well. I don't have the number in front of me. I have my computer, but I, I don't have my number in front of, uh, the number in front of me, but there was a bill filed by Representative Allison Sullivan. Oh, excellent. Uh, I'll circle back for that at an, for another yeah. interview uh, with her. Um, yeah. Let's go back to your important bill. So you said it's got bipartisan support. That's great to hear. Um, how, you know, what's, what is its status? What can people do to help you pass it? Uh, and um, what, you know, what are you hearing from your colleagues and from your constituents about support for this bill or opposition? Well, it, well, it's difficult. Um, so the status is right now that we're, we're trying to get a hearing. In Massachusetts, um, any bill that is filed after after the first month that we're in session. So anything filed in February February and beyond uh, in, a, in a session is called a late file bill. Mm -hmm. uh, anything filed before that automatically gets a public hearing and, and, and goes through the process. A late file bill has to be pushed through the process. It has to be kind of, um, I, I, I jokingly say, but kind of not jokingly, is say you have to beg your way through there just to get hearings and things of that nature to try to push it through. So that's where we're at, is trying to move it through the process. I think part of the problem is that, of course, as you know, we have a Republican governor, Charlie Baker, who, who I like, I, you know, I, I like our Republican governor, he's a great guy, um, but he's trying to mandate these, he, he's got this emergency powers. Uh, I just saw the other day, he's contemplating a, um, an actual app on your phone, the, the passport app on your phone. Um, and the Democrat majority is certainly in favor of these sweeping powers that, that um, have been established. So you've kind of got both sides working together on this. And what that makes for is a smaller group of us trying to push these things 
with no real leadership um, at, uh, up at the upper levels to to want to do this. I understand. I don't really get, as a former political consultant, I don't really get the politics on the other side for these mm -hmm. measures. They're not popular with parents. They're right. not popular with now millions of people who don't want to be coerced into a medical treatment they're not choosing. How do they think this will play out in the midterms? And, and why would, kind of a second question, why would a Republican governor take such a hard line, not in alignment with very popular decisions by other Republican governors like DeSantis and Kirsty Noem? Well, it, it's interesting because I think, you know, we saw not that long ago, I want to say maybe a couple of weeks ago, a, a couple of surveys come out, uh, a couple of polls come out regarding the mask mandates and regarding the uh, vax mandates in Massachusetts. And I saw, I saw a statistic that said 85% of the people agree that all children and school teachers should be should be required to wear a mask. And I thought to myself, how on earth can that, that be not possible? right? Uh, and like, then it was, again, it was a majority of, of people, I forget, it wasn't, it wasn't a super majority like that, but maybe, maybe in the neighborhood of 55, 60% of the people believe that we should have a vax mandate. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I, I hate to use that, that term that, that Republicans love to use, right? The, the fake news, but I'm thinking, news? how on earth can this be possible? Yeah, I mean, there are some pretty tendentious polls out there, you know, launched by pretty partisan or, you know, you know, entities that are kind of in the pockets of one side or another. So if I can't see the data sets and to date, I haven't been allowed to see yeah. any of the data sets for some of these things, um, I, I would take that with a huge grain of salt. I know that, you know, we live part time in Massachusetts and uh, left, right across the board, no parent wants right. their kid to be coerced into this kind of learning situation. And and overwhelmingly people want to make their own medical choices. I don't I I, I do not know anyone who supports the mandates, you know. I so too and it's you know, I have from the moment I filed this bill, I filed this bill on a Thursday afternoon. I remember it specifically because by Thursday evening I hadn't even I, I haven't even put any information out there. Somebody was scanning the the uh, website by Thursday afternoon, the emails in support of this bill came in, and they're coming in at a rate faster than any bill I've ever filed in my wow, tenure. That's so exciting. And and they are literally, they it's literally five hundred to one in favor. And so I don't, again, I don't understand. You you right, can't right. that these polls are real. No, they're, uh, yeah, let's not even. It, yeah, spend time on them because if we can't see the data sets, we can't verify that they're real. Exactly. Uh, so let's go now to how people can help you. It's it's very exciting that you're getting all of this support, but concerning that there are these hurdles ahead to you know to move it along. If people want to support your amendment, um, does it matter if they're your constituent or not your constituent? Isn't it important if they lobby their own representative as well in the state of Massachusetts? That's exactly right. Um, we're getting emails from all over the state, and they say, "How can I help?" And I say, "Email." your representative or senator and ask them to sign on um, and be vocal about it and, and, and do it often. So that's all we're asking for is to try to build that momentum to get this bill moving through the process. Right. It's very, it's as simple as that. Yeah, and how about events? I mean, I've seen very powerful gatherings, rallies, you know, voters showing up at state houses, even if they're closed, showing up outside state houses. Would that be effective? Should people ask for meetings with their, uh, the chiefs of staff of their, um, you know, elected officials? I mean, is there something hands on people can do to like show up and be counted? Well, I, I do think that it's always important that you, when you, when reaching out to your representative or senator, that you do it in a personal way. Um, I, I'm always a fan of saying, don't click the form emails, right. because because a, as a representative, I say honestly, when I see a hundred form emails come in, I usually just delete them because if all you could do is click a button, you don't care okay, that much. <laughs> yeah, how committed are you to this? Right, right. Um, but it's it's important that you send. It doesn't have to be a book that you're writing to these folks. Just send a, a one or two line or one or two paragraph email saying uh, your personal story about it. Yeah. Um, we are having an event and I, I don't have the exact date on it yet where we are in Boston 
uh, talking about vax mandates and uh, mainly vax mandates, not the mask mandates, uh, where we're going to have panels of doctors and scientists um, and public health officials to try to bring awareness to this. And I can certainly reach out to you and give you that detail as we get more information, but it'll be sometime in, in, in October. In October, that would be wonderful. In the meantime, people can lobby their own elected official. Um, they can presumably choose to assemble outside the state house. Um, they can, uh, can they offer to um, raise money for people who will support this for their reelection? I've been often wondering how to, you know, what are the levers of power to, to get your representative to really pay attention to you? Sure, I'll pitch for repdurant.com. <laughs> um, it's, it's yeah, repdurant.com. It, yeah, it's important. I, you know, it, it's it it is important that um, we get those people who have the the political fortitude to to bring these issues forward. Um, I, I think too often uh, our politicians, and I say this as one of them. I I, I think it's it, it's too often. It's just easier to take the the kind of the quiet road, you know, don't make waves, just kind of move along. But these are important issues. I mean, this is probably one of the, the, the most important issues that I've had in my time in the legislature. Why do people in office right now think that if they don't support your bill, they'll be reelected if there's so much support for your bill? Well, you know, I think a lot of it is, is you, you know, how much are they hearing from their constituents on it? Right. Right. Um, I've gotten a lot of emails. I've, I've probably gotten about a thousand or so emails on this, right. and, and that's but that's from everybody around the state. So, right. in, in a state of seven million people, that's not that many. Right. Um, but but the more your representative and senator hears from you, uh, then the more they start to think about it themselves. Thank you. And lastly, how can people in Massachusetts lobby? Governor Baker, I frequently tried to phone him. They wouldn't take my calls. They wouldn't get back to me. Um, yeah. I'm just asking for data underlie, underlying uh, mask mandates. Never got any data. So my question to you is, have you been given any data to support um, the idea that vaccine passports help in any way with the spread of COVID? They don't. Um, and have you been given any data about mask mandates? And lastly, yeah, can people lobby the governor as well? So, um, no, we haven't seen a lot of a lot of really hard data. And I'm a data guy, too. I love that. I, I love looking at the data and digging through it. We haven't seen a lot of that hard information that's come from uh, the Department of Public Health. Um, we mainly get uh, they have a they used to have and I think it's been shut down as the uh, the uh, dashboard that will show you how many cases are active and things uh, of that. nature. That's not peer reviewed published data. <laughs> no. And and so we don't get to see the raw data on that. Uh, you can lobby the governor. Um, we have actually, we have, uh, the Republican caucus has a, um, um, meetings with him every month. And, and so we try to bring some of these things up, but again, being a Republican governor and being in favor of these mandates, a half of our caucus says, Hey, you know what? I, I I'm fine with it. I'm in favor of it too. If you are. Wow. So it, it takes a little intestinal fortitude to try to break through that, but you, yeah, you can certainly lobby the governor's office, uh, through email. They, I'm. Um, I, I can tell you that there's not always a lot of people in the office either. Um, it's it's because the state house is not an active place. A lot of people are still working from home, wow. so emails uh, emails are getting replied to, of course, but um, phone calls don't always get replied to very quickly. Wow, that's also powerful information. Well, mm. once again, you've been so generous with your time. We'll do all we can to bring attention to your fantastic uh, amendment, beautifully worded. Uh, I'm sure you don't mind if we post it so other states, other constituents, other leaders can uh, be inspired by the language and maybe tailor the language to their own state. Um, and uh, we, you know, we are here to update as things move along. You know, please check in with us if you have time. Tell us what's going on. Lastly, people can support representative durant by going to rep durant r-e-p-d-u-r-a-n-t dot com very easy fantastic so if you like what he's doing send emails but also especially if you're his constituents but more importantly reach out to your own or as importantly your own representatives yeah. and send money don't forget to to you know you got you get the democracy that you <laughs> got to put your resources where your mouth is everybody so that's bill hd4416 in the massachusetts state legislature representative durant thank you so much for your time and we will keep shining a light on your important work thank you so much for having me thank you <laughs>